Holy Spirit. Amen. Direct, we beseech thee, O Lord, all our actions by thy holy inspiration, and accompany them by thy grace, so that our every thought, word, and deed may both begin from thee, and through thee reach completion through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Very beautiful prayer. Very relevant. Very well. Well, welcome back, everyone, as we continue the book of Revelation. We're journeying through uh, the Blessed Scriptures, the last book in the Bible, written by none other than John the Beloved, um, the youngest of the Twelve, the one who outlived the Twelve, the person who had the Virgin Mary stay with him in his house. We're on 16. Um, this week, thank you, Michael, for we'll be um, doing Revelation chapter 16. But before we get into Revelation 16, we'll give a little summary. So bring us up to um, scratch to where we were from what we'd done last week. Um, so a little bit from last week, we looked at 15, where we spoke about uh, the Song of Moses from the Old Testament in the book of uh, Deuteronomy or Exodus, I believe it was, when the Israelites sung a song to rejoice before the Lord when they got freed from Egypt. And we saw how in the, um, heaven, in the kingdom to come, that they'll be singing a song like the Song of Moses, but we'll be giving thanks for God's deliverance. And we read through that beautiful psalmody um, and we heard the hymn played, chanted in a Coptic uh, Christian style of playing, which is a very early ancient style of worship. Um, so some of us really enjoyed those. Twice in the Roman liturgy, in the liturgy of the Easter Vigil Mass, and also uh, in the Divine Office, there's a hymn of praise called the Te, the Te Deum. To him it plays it, it includes the words of that yes. song of Moses. Exactly. So it's a very ancient song which the Israelites sing and which we still sing today. Um, but it isn't very well known, so I thought it would be good and beneficial for us to have a read of that, which we did. We had to listen to it. Um, so again, we have sort of spoke about the last plagues. Uh, we spoke, the beginning of the book was the message to the churches. The next section was what's going to happen, things that have happened. It's the angel revealed to John things that are going to happen. Uh, sorry, things that are happening and things that will happen. So discussing how Revelation encompasses all of history. Um, so now we're on Revelation chapter 16, and we'll begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple, telling the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth. The foul and evil souls came upon the men who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The second angel poured his bowl in the sea, and it became like blood of a dead man. And every living seed thing died that was in the sea. The third angel poured his bowl into the rivers and the fountains of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of water say, Just as you are, <clears throat> just are you, just are you, in these your judgments, for you who are and who were, O holy one. For men have shed the blood of the prophets and saints, and you have given them blood to drink. It is their due. And I heard the altar cry, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The fourth angel poured his bowl and the su on the sun, and he was allowed to scorch men with fire. Men were scorched by fire and heat, and they cursed the name of God who had given power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. The fifth angel poured his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was darkness. Men gnawed their, te gnawed their tongues in anguish, and cursed the God of heaven for the pains and sores, and did not repent of their deeds. The sixth angel poured his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, to prepare the way for the kings of the east. And I saw issuing forth from the dragon, and from the mouth of the beast, and from the mouth of the false prophets, three foul spirits like frogs, for they are demonic spirits, performing signs, who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle of the great day <coughs> of God the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is he who is awake, keeping his garments, that he may not go naked and be seen exposed. And they assembled in the place which is called in Hebrew Armageddon. The seventh angel poured his bowl into the air, and the great voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning, loud, loud noises, pearls of thunder, and a great earthquake such as never been seen since men on the earth. So great was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and God remembered great Babylon to make her drain the cup of the fury of his wrath. 
and every island fled away and no mountains were to be found. And great hailstones, heavy as a hundred weight, dropped from, on men from heaven till men cursed God for the plague of hail. So fearful was that plague. So that's the chapter. Welcome to our guests. I just pick myself up off the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so this is probably one of the last, if not the last time, we're going to get the imagery of these plagues coming upon the earth. The last sort of series of plagues before the Lord's finally going to come in the next coming chapters. So we'll go ahead and we'll speak about these and we'll go through them sentence by sentence. Uh, can you, someone pass me the Bible that's in there, please? That's just the top one. Right away we can see these plagues uh, remind us of what happened in Egypt with Pharaoh. So in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, it tells the story of the Exodus, which means departure, which is what the Hebrew word Exodus means. Um, tells the story of the departure of the Israelites um, in bondage from Pharaoh to being free, going through 40 years in the desert, entering the promised land. All of these plagues, and we're going to go through them and speak about how they resemble so chapter 15. So it starts, then I saw another angel in heaven. So this is separating from the previous angels. Last week we had another a sign, which distinct, was distinct from the sign in Revelation chapter 12 with the woman. Last week there was another sign, um, the lamb, the 144,000. Now this week there's another angel coming to John and providing him with this insight. Then he says, there were seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for which the wrath of God is ended. So as I said, oops, that was last week. That was last week. Apologies. Um, then I heard a loud voice in the temple telling the seven angels. So these are the same seven angels. Now it's their time to go and act, to go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So again, this is the last series. The end is coming very near. The first angel poured his bowl on the earth and foul and evil souls came upon the men who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. So again, we prior... Last week, actually, and the week before, we spoke about the mark of the beast. We spoke about Hippolytus of Rome, the Pope from the 4th century. And we spoke about the mark of the beast being those who reject the Lord with their mind and with their deeds, who reject him um, and to live out the precepts of the Lord. Uh, <clears throat> and evil sores will come upon those people. So, which plague was this? Okay. So, for those who can remember... There were 10 plagues that came upon the Egyptians. I'm gonna, I'll go through them and we're going to see how they're going to correlate. But one of those 10 plagues is from Exodus uh, chapter 9. There is two chapters in Exodus. I don't know if we're going to have time to read it all because it's two full chapters. Um, but maybe if anyone wants us to read them, we can have a read of them. Otherwise, we can skim through so as to not read the two chapters. I'll just skim through. Yeah. So that's in Exodus chapter 9. We'll go have a look through and read. Um, I'm going to read a little bit, so I might just pick and choose. Okay, Exodus chapter 9, verse 8. <clears throat> So the plague of the sores was the sixth plague that happened to them. However, in this series, in the last times, this will be the first plague that will be sent upon them. What the sores are were like boils on their skin. If anyone watched the movie, um, there's a lot of movies of Moses. Um, there's the Prince of Egypt. It's a nice one that I recommend for everyone. Uh, it's like a cartoon sort of movie, very popular. Even You can watch it as an adult. They show you the boils and things that afflicted the people. So this was the sixth plague in Egypt. This will be the first plague in the last times that the angels sang. And then verse 2 which of chapter 15 of the book of Revelation. Uh, sorry, chapter 16 of verse 2. Apologies. Verse 3. The second angel, which is now the second sign, poured out his bowl into the sea and it became like the blood of a dead man. And every living thing died that was in the sea. Does everyone remember the first plague that Moses did? The first of the seven? Turning the Nile River into blood. So from water into blood. 
So that was the first plague. And then subsequent, subsequently all the creatures in the sea died. So this is now this is the second plague in the book of Revelation. <coughs> we spoke about already um, the image of the bowl or the cup, how God pours it out, pours out his wrath on men. That was um, a couple weeks ago we spoke about that. So those who want to know more about that, if they don't remember, we can ask in the Q&A section. But I'm going to skim over the things we've already covered so as to not go through the same things again. Um, again, the recordings are available to listen for those who want to. So the image of God pouring the bowl of wrath upon them. Now verse 4, the third angel poured his bowl into the rivers and the fountains of water and they became blood. So now it's not just um, in the sea, in the rivers and the fountains of water. So this, um, this plague or this curse is spreading. And he heard the angel of the water say, the angel of the water say, Just are you in these your judgments, you who were and who are, O holy one. For the men um, have shed blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, it is their drew. So the reason I want to focus on this is, um, the study of angels, I think it's called angel, angelology, Father Benjamin, correct me, uh, Father Chad Rimbaud actually talks a lot about this, how God assigned the angels over creation as, um, what's the word, like caretakers, as caretakers of a certain thing. So every church would have an angel. So in the Latin Mass, they still pray to the angel of the church to protect the church. Um, some say that every family has a special angel over that family. And now this is the angel of the sea. So then I heard the angel of the, the water say, just are you in your judgments. So, God will appoint angels over certain things to take care of that. Um, of course, not all the angels accepted their uh, responsibility and accepted their task from God. But hence, um, we learned earlier that one third of the angels fell away. We saw that earlier in the book of Revelation. But two thirds of the angels did accept their role and accept um, serving the Lord. So, this is an angel who saw these, and his comment wasn't, Oh, you know, why do you do that, Lord? But his comment was, just are you, O God, in your judgments, for you've, you know, just and true. For he says, just as they've shed the blood of the prophets, so this is their due, that the water turns into blood. We can learn a few things from this. One of those things is um, God's judgments are true. And sometimes we can think they're not fair. Sometimes we can feel like, you know, this is a very heavy burden God's allowing on us. Or, Lord, why are you allowing this thing to happen? But we should remember that it's all in God's wisdom. And at the end of the day, He's the one who's in charge and it's for his greater glory. And sometimes not everything that God allows, we're going to maybe have a natural affinity and a natural liking to, but it's all going to work for the glory of God at the end of the day and we should trust everything to him. Uh, and second thing is that, yes, there are angels and yes, they're very active in the world. Uh, we don't see them. St. Padre said, if we saw the demons, they'd, be, they'd block out the sun from our vision. Um, that's just one third. So there's two thirds that are good. So there's a whole lot of angels doing a whole lot of things in the world. And we ask for angels to help us, to guide this Bible study, to help our hearts be open for the Lord as well. Okay. Verse 8. The fourth angel poured his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch men with fire. Men were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had given power over these plagues. And they did not repent and give him glory. So three things we can take from this. So one of the Egyptian gods, one of maybe their chief god, um, for those who know about the Egypt, Egyptian Ra. faith, was Ra, yeah, yeah, which was the sun god. Yeah. So all the ten plagues in the Old Testament each attack one of the gods of the Egyptians. Uh, there's a whole big theology about the Old Testament. I recommend uh, this section in Exodus. So I recommend maybe, can't think of a talk who goes through all ten of them. Um, but if someone wants to look in more into this, the Old Testament, all ten of the plagues attack a certain god, a god of the Egyptians. And the Lord sends a plague to oppose that. Um, and this is nonetheless the same thing. A lot of people um, believe that the sun has healing powers as if the sun itself is going to heal you. Sun gazing, um, people worshipping, trying to harness the sun's power. Even to today, some people believe this pagan uh, ideology. But that was very prominent um, back in the days, and unfortunately it's still... It's a form of worshipping the sun. I mean... The sun does provide health, vitamin D, but it's not like the sun is going to heal you. It's like the vitamin D it provides, it's not the sun itself. Um, so what will happen? This plague, the sun will be um, strengthened in a way, and people will be scorched with fire. So 
instead of repenting, they didn't repent and they didn't give him glory. It records, so they, their hearts were hardened. Sort of like Pharaoh's heart. So God was doing all these great things, showing him the signs, the wonders, the power of the Lord, Yahweh. But Pharaoh wasn't ready to listen um, until much later on. And even then he changed and he repented of his decision. Tried to chase the Egyptians and then got drowned in the sea. Um, okay, the, the sixth plague, so verse 12. The sixth angel poured his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings of the east. This is a very interesting verse which we're going to come back and circle around to. And I saw issuing from the mouth of the dragon and from the mouth of the beast and from the mouth of the false prophet three foul spirits like frogs. So one of the plagues in the Old Testament was an excess of frogs that came out, spread over all of Egypt, um, which was also one of their gods that they worshipped. So this is going to be a similar thing where now the frogs are representing, says next verse, demonic spirits that perform signs and go abroad to kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle of the, <clears throat> the Lord God. So the final battle. Next verse. And they assembled at the place which is called in Hebrew Armageddon. WWE has this thing called Armageddon. So that's where they get it from. WWE. WWE World Wrestling. 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 Yeah, a lot of people say I Armageddon. That's, that, that's literally what I meant. They a lot of sec the secular world uses religious things. Um, what, and just, what do they use it for? Like for, a a pay -per -view, for a pay per view, Father. So a show that they have once a month that you have to pay to watch on a one off. This it's is like a, a special battle, like a very big hyped up event. That's what they call it. They have it. a show every yeah, week right. and then they have a show that, oh, this is our big thing, pay to watch it. It's called Armageddon. Armageddon, what? which it's resembles the last one. battle. Yeah, the, they the have the final this, battle. They've they got other ones, they've got like Royal Rumble. They have Hell in a Cell too, if you want to take another shot at God. See you not, see you not. <laughs> 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 Thanks for <laughs> so that's And the reason that I'm saying that is the world doesn't respect God. They hate God, and that's the reality. Because Jesus himself said the way is narrow that leads to salvation and broad and wide, and many are following the other road. Um, unfortunately, a lot of a lot of companies, uh, a lot of businesses like to use holy things or holy names or um, things in the scriptures and turn them for their advantage. Um, there's a lot of examples. One of them is the Armageddon example. Uh, you see this leftist agenda attacking God. Um, this homosexual agenda attacking the idea of Adam and Eve. Science not um, trying to... Some people believing that science and religion are somehow opposed, whereas they're not opposed. Science reveals what God has done. God gave us gravity. Science didn't make gravity. God put gravity in motion. It's a constant law across the whole earth. Um, and science just reveals to us how God done what he done. But it doesn't tell you where everything came from. God. God's the one who made everything. God's the one who set all the... Foundations. All the scriptures tell us, especially the Old Testament verse Psalms, like God put everything in motion. What does that mean? How does a bee know how to make honey? Did, did science teach the bee? Okay, bee, you need to make honey, you need to do this, breed, go take care of your queen, go work, build your hive. Science can't tell you why the, why the um, bee makes honey. That's how God set that animal and that's the purpose that God gave for that animal. Just like God set everything in motion. So they're not opposed. Um, which is the point of this, and the world doesn't respect God, but we need to respect Him, and we've got to try and love Him. Okay, verse 15, a little bit before that. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is he who is awake, keeping his garment, that he may not go naked and be seen exposed. Very charged verse. I am coming like a thief. Albert, I'm going to ask you a question. Um, if you know a thief is going to come into your house and break in at exactly 3.13 a.m., are you going to be asleep or are you going to be waiting? I'll be waiting. Obviously. You'll be waiting, right? Yeah. You're not going to... Make, especially if you know he's coming. Yeah. But what happens if... I'll probably be on the phone more. <laughs> yeah! Yes, he would. <laughs> or maybe Laurie, actually. Laurie, would Laurie yeah. Up at that time? Yeah. Laurie yeah, yeah. Laurie's the only one up at that time. What was the same, man? <laughs> Jesus gives the example... <laughs> He says, in the scriptures, I'm coming like a thief. He says, gives a parable. Uh, imagine the owner of the home was to come home and to see the servant waiting. You know, he'd commend the servant. Good on you. You're ready. You're waiting for me. Well done. What if he was to come at an unexpected time and he was getting drunk and beating the other servants? What would he do to him? 
getting into trouble. The same is true for us. Sometimes no one knows when they're going to die unless God revealed it to them personal revelation. But most people don't know when they're going to die. We could all right now, some Russia or China, whatever, strike us right now. We're all dead in the next two minutes. Unfortunately, that's the reality. We don't know. Um, so we always need to be ready. We could be, you know, going to dinner. Someone gets hit by a car. But you don't know. That's the reality. And we've, I've, unfortunately, it happens. Like Out of nowhere, someone will be around. You'll speak to them one day. And then the next day, they they pass away. It's happened, actually, even in my life. Someone I know. Uh, they were there. And then they were just not there anymore. Just as simple as that. And it was really sad. But that person was ready. Praise God. And hopefully he entered into the kingdom. But this is a rally for everyone. The Lord is coming and coming like a thief. <clears throat> By that he means you don't know when you're going to die. You don't know when you're going to see him. <coughs> no one knows. So just be ready. Always be ready. So that you won't be seen exposed and naked. So what does that mean? So in the end we're going to be receiving a garment. A white garment for those who are just. Like a literal garment to clothe us in the kingdom of um, white colour. If you see the paintings they usually depict it pretty good. Of um, the people who are redeemed by the Lord. And if you look at the flip side of those who go to hell. Of the damned. They're always naked. Um, symbolizing their shame. Their nakedness. Everything's seen. You're not going to lie. People think. Oh I'm going to go do X, Y and Z on earth. And no one's going to know. Only I'll know. And for whatever reason. No one else needs to know. But the reality is. As we've heard. Father Benson I think talks about it as well. Uh, the final judgment. Everyone's sin is going to be exposed. Everyone's going to know everything. That happened. Jesus said in the book of John, whatever you uttered in the dark will be proclaimed on the housetops. So everything's going to be known. Uh, so get used to living in freedom and get used to doing the right thing, not um, living in darkness. Because again, as the book of John says, uh, the light came into the world, but they loved darkness. So they didn't turn to the light because their sins, because of their own wickedness. When someone does the wrong thing, they don't want people to know. If you... If someone takes a smartwatch, for example, and they steal a smartwatch, you're not going to go around telling people, unless you're somehow you take pride in your sin, but that's from the devil. No person who has dignity is going to say, hey, I stole 10 smartwatches, look at me. They're going to try hey, and hide that. The smartwatch from Joey. They're going to try and hide the fact to live in the darkness. Hence, they don't want to come to the light. But in the end, you're not going to run away. You'll be clothing garment if you come into the righteousness, <clears throat> or you'll be naked. Um, literally and symbolically, symbolically because everyone's going to know what you've done, and literally because you will be naked in, in hell. So that's what that verse is about. Okay. Verse 17 The seventh angel poured his bow into the air, and a great voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. So the seventh plague, this is now um, the seventh one complete. And there were flashes of thunder. Loud noises, pearls of thunder, <clears throat> and a great earthquake such as never been seen on the earth. The great city was split in three parts, and the nations fell. And God remembered great Babylon to make her drain the cup of fu the fury of his wrath. And every island fell away, and there were no mountains to be found. And then there was a plague, the plague of the hail. And so fearful was that plague. Now, that was that chapter, but it sort of closely links to the next chapter. Is there any questions so far about that? Because we've only been going for like 20 something minutes. No, I just want to add, like, the river Euphrates actually dried up. Just wanted to add that since... I think it's tied. seasonal. It's, it goes and it comes back. So, with that one. Just like the Red Sea, sometimes um, it has... Like, sorry, the Jordan River. Sometimes it has high points and low points. But thanks for jumping poking that in. Any other questions from someone? I thought we can continue just to keep with the theme. Um, chapter 17. Then one of the seven angels who had come with the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot, who is seated upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and with the wine of whose fornication the dwellers on the earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of blasphemous names. And he had seven heads and ten horns. Okay. So immediately what you will notice, <clears throat> the idea of Babylon. This links to chapter 12. 
Why does it link to chapter 12 about the great woman? Because there was a woman as well. This woman was a good woman. But she fled into the wilderness and the beast was trying to consume her. Now we have the other woman. Uh, as John is recording it. This one is full of fornication and adultery. Whose wine has caused uh, the dwellers of the earth to become drunk. We spoke about what, what, the idea, what the symbolism of the wine is. Multiple. But firstly, fornication resembling um, idolatry. So when Israel sinned against God, turning into the other gods, asking them for favors, worshiping them, offering incense, God reckoned them as um, harlots, prostitutes, because they turned against their husband, the Lord, to foreign gods. Now what this great harlot, Babylon, this person has been leading the other dwellers on the earth, aka spreading idolatry, spreading the evil um, ways to the pers people who live on the world. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and impurities of her fornication. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of harlots and of earth's abominations. So we spoke about Babylon a little bit, speaking about how it was in Mesopotamia, where a great certain bishop is from. Uh, <laughs> sad to say that one. Had to get that one off my chest. Okay. Is that uh, your system now? <laughs> I had to get that off my chest. Yes. No, so there's a certain bishop who's from this area. Um, uh, Marmari. Bishop Marmari. Marmari Emmanuel. Um, oh, right. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Mesopotamia in Babylon, which is modern day Iraq. So, Why are we getting him to come to give us a talk? Why? I've got to talk to you about that, Father. We'll, go, we'll talk about, about that. Body, but let's not get has. sidetracked. Let's go back to the topic. So Mar -Mar that was my fault. I shouldn't have threw that in. I shouldn't have threw that in. Anyway. Um, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and earth's abominations. So Mesopotamia or where the Tower of Babel was, that area they say is the most ancient civilization. where they, have, they can, Science tells us they have very ancient artifacts from that period in history. Uh, I recommend you go and look at that ancient Babylon, what the life was like. Um, there's a thing called a ziggurat. It's like a tower where you walk up and they used to worship on the top and offer sacrifices of humans, chop people's head off, sort of like the Aztecs, offer animals, um, very um, common with the Old Testament or historical religions, all about offering blood. Um, the Jews themselves used to offer the blood, but not of humans, of animals. They used to burn their babies. To Molech and the other demons um, or gods, but they used to offer the sacrifice of animals. Okay. Um, and I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. But the angel said to me, Why marvel? I will tell you of the mystery of the woman and of the beasts with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you see was and is not, and is to ascend from the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to behold the beast, because it was and is not and is to come. So we see the language first of the Lord. The Lord, he was, he is and he is to come. They worship the Lord, the 24 elders, prior in the chapter. The beast, aka the devil, um, he was acting before, in this time in history, 2000 years ago. He's acting at the time, and he'll be continuing acting. The devil's not on the same level as God. The devil is not, there's no arm wrestle between God and the devil. The devil is infinitely less than God. But the, Im the image that I'm trying to get us to realize is um, the comparison between the two. And that's who's behind Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. It's the devil himself, spreading his errors, um, drunk with the blood of the saints. Again, <clears throat> we're going to talk, probably we'll come back to that, because that's another topic in itself. Okay. Verse 8. The people whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. We also spoke about the book of life. Um, there's a book where everyone's names, who's going to go to heaven, is in that book. If your name's not in that book, you're not going into the kingdom. It appears several times in the Old Testament. Um, it appeared as well in the book of Revelation with the scroll. Um, but we did speak about this in depth. So I encourage those who want to know more to go back and listen to that. Um, 
which I think it was. But it's, not, it's not a form of predestination, like God predetermines some people to go to heaven, some people go to hell. Um, if your name is written in the book, in a sense it's written at the moment of your death, because that's the moment your will becomes fixed on whether it's God or evil. So it's not like some Protestants believe that God has predestined, despite how good you are in your life, God has predestined some people to go to hell and some people go to, he to heaven. It's quite a cruel doctrine, actually. If your name is in the book of the living, in a sense, it's written in there at the point of your death. That's when your will becomes fixed on whether it's uh, God or evil. I would just add to that. Um, the book was already established before the foundation of the world. So God already knows whether you're going to pick X or Y, whether you're going to pick him or pick something else. It's not that the name is written when you die. The name is already well, what, there. What I, what I mean is we still have freedom. So it's not like like what some Protestants Protestants yep. would think. Yeah. Definitely so. C certainly, God can, certainly God knows all things. He knows the future. But mysteriously in that, we still have free will. It's a mystery. It's a great mystery. Definitely, definitely. So John Calvin, <clears throat> uh, we'll quickly touch on this because mindful that not everyone was here for that. He said that this thing called double predestination. He said that if God was to ride you like a donkey, you're going to go to heaven. If God doesn't ride you like a donkey, you're going to go to hell. So you don't really have a choice. God's already determined. He wants you in heaven. You know, I won't, I won't point to you, but he wants X person in hell. <clears throat> the idea of predestination is a Catholic doctrine. St. Augustine taught predestination. We do believe in predestination. What does predestination mean? Predestination, the legitimate predestination... Um, is the idea that God wants to, he loves us with a predilective love, aka God wants everyone to be in heaven, which he does. But not everyone is going to choose to accept God's love and God's desire. So if people don't choose, it's their freedom, they're not going to inherit the kingdom. But as Father Ben said, the Lord knows who's going to choose and who's not going to choose. That's why the book was written from the foundation of the world. God already knows he's going to say yes. But it doesn't mean you don't have the choice. Michael, every time we go out, you get chips. Or chicken or a chicken burger. Yeah. You have the choice of the whole menu, but or you choose that. Pack. You know? <laughs> a snack pack. <laughs> like, I don't think I've had it. No, nah, father hasn't been out with him. Father doesn't know. Chips, chicken um, chicken burger, or like literally... Chicken schnitzel burgers. Yeah, or schnitzel. Yeah, or schnitzel. Yeah, or schnitzel. Yeah. But the choice is yeah, for him. Yeah. You know, you have the yeah. choice of the whole menu. I just know what you're going to choose. Yeah. God's oh, like that, but infinitely more. Yeah. No, awesome. you know? Listen, there's 17 NRL teams Vince can choose to say when I ask him this question, but if I say, who do you support? I know he's going to say the Bulldogs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, he's ripping them now for Jersey. Para doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, good luck but, telling your wife that. But the point is that the Lord knows <laughs> infinitely more than I know and you know. But that doesn't mean that Michael's not free to choose something else. Just like I'm free to do... I'm free, you know, God forbid, to say the wrong teaching and I'm free to teach the authentic doctrine. It's my choice. I can choose to tell people my opinion or I can choose to tell people about the scriptures. Everyone has a choice. Just like Father Benton. Everyone makes a million choices a day. Not all of them are moral choices. They're like, you know, do I want sparkling water or normal water? It's not a moral choice, but... It's a human, human action. It's a human yeah, action. I can choose to say I don't want to be female anymore. I want to be a tree today. <laughs> uh, you know, that's your right to choose. <laughs> to choose to be crazy. <laughs> no, <laughs> God forbid. Some choices are not legitimate. <laughs> yes, and that's some are not moral. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, however, again, God, knowing all things, um, has written this amazing book, which is going to be interesting in the last day. You know, this big scroll is going to get open. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, sorry. You know, you don't want to be that person. No one wants to be that person. Okay, let's continue before we get too much too sidetracked. Um, because it was not meant to come. Verse nine. This calls for a mind of wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he will remain only a little while. Okay, who are, who are these people talking about? We actually already covered this in the past. Um, the seven are seven kings, seven kingdoms, five have already fallen, and one is. So does everyone know who at the time was the world empire, or the world superpower, if you want to call it that, at the time of uh, John's writing? Rome. Romans. Romans. The Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was um, <clears throat> number six in this list, five had already fallen. Does everyone remember the prophecy of Daniel? I don't know. 
the prophecy of Daniel the where he beasts, saw the four beasts was it we, we spoke about it in that time, but it, yeah, it links to that. Daniel was very big. So, basically, Daniel had a vision of a huge statue of clay, of bronze, of iron, of something. Um, and eventually, one was destroyed by the other one. That was destroyed by another one. That was destroyed. Uh, the last was um, in that image, represented Rome. And then the rock comes, destroys all of it. The cornerstone, the rock representing Christ, the Messiah, is going to come at the time get rid of all the other powers and establish the kingdom, a.k.a. the church. So that happened. We're living in that time. Um, but there's one more to come. So there's one more of these kingdoms to come. I'm not going to tell you I know who that is. Many people have tried to say different things, but I can tell you definitely five of them, you can I go in the book of Daniel, you can see what they are. The Persians, the Medo-Persians, pretty much one of them was Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom. Then it was Cyrus who came and defeated Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. Those two, I can tell you 100%, I know. Um, and the others, just because I'm going off the top of my head, I wasn't expecting to cover this chapter. But they, they're listed in Daniel and in the Old Testament. And if you read Maccabees, you can see. What's Generally, the, what's the one that is to come? In your that's the question. Oh, it's too hard, in your Father. Madam, I answer it for you. Yes, he will. <laughs> it's, he will. it's one of those things that... Say the US. Because a lot of empires have already come and fallen. That's the thing. It's not yes. like... Yes, there's a third, right? There's all kinds of... And there's one to come. I'm... There's what heaps of know? empires that have fallen and come already. <laughs> the Muslims. Like, how many different empires have come and gone? Especially the Islam Empire. Like that, if anything, that one almost took over the whole world. That was there was, the Ottomans. If, like, the Caliph, uh, the 6th century, 600s, 600 year plus um, empire. Um, tomorrow is their thing. That's when we were tonight. No Indians. Oh, right. There was 1 million in Wickham. 1.5 million. Ask the question. Yeah. Talking. Or, what's your question if you say it louder? No, it, it is no, today, but the Armenian genocide, 108 years ago, 1915, right. the Ottoman Empire literally martyred them all. They're all martyred because mm. Christianity, they don't want them. Mm. Yes. It's bad. Did you have a question, Anthony? Um, they did in Lebanon. They did in Lebanon. 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 He yes. destroyed Solomon's temple, right? Nebuchadnezzar is the one who destroyed the temple and exiled all of the Jews. That was 400 uh, years Jews. later after Solomon. After... Wasn't it 538, wasn't it? Something? Don't have the exact date. In the the BC, Lebanon but it was BC. It's called Sather Badli. Yeah, yeah. Mount Lebanon. Was, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's mm -hmm. to make Thanks for sharing that, guys. Um, verse 11. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth but belongs to the seven, and it goes to perdition. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind and give over their power and authority to the beast, and they will make war on the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and those with him who are called chosen and faithful. So there's ten, there's ten kings to come. They don't list them. So historically, there's been more than 10 evil rulers. However, I suppose in one, one way or another, one day we'll find out exactly who these 10 people are. Maybe someone will have a revelation. Um, or the church fathers. I didn't look at what they said about this, but it would be very interesting to see what they say. Um, however, for those who want to look more into it, you can look for um, anything that I pretty much am giving you, generally, uh, will be coming from the church fathers. There's a lot of websites where you can just go and see what they say. There's one website in particular that I will share with you uh, where you can search a verse in the Bible and it will tell you what the church fathers say about that one verse. It's called Catholic Cross Reference. So catholiccrossreference.online slash fathers. Uh, and from that, so let me search it right now and see what they say. These are one mind. That's pretty self-explanatory. All right, verse 12. So we'll check Revelation 17, verse 12. Okay, there's a lot here. Let's see what Tartulian has to say. Okay. So Tartulian was from um, the 3rd century, so from the 200s. He was one of the great church fathers. However, towards the end of his life, he joined a, a heretical sect. He became very rigid, um, sort of like some people in the Catholic Church today. Um, he rebelled against the Pope. 
uh, called the Pope, like a title that uh, was given to Caesar to say, you know, you're going too far. Um, some of the things he did. But anyway, let me use somewhere else now, since I've gone through that. <laughs> <laughs> he, he did start very well, though. He has a lot of good writings, but then you see them change as he got older and then turned away from the Catholic Church. Okay, where's this? What does he say? So, I just have to sift through this information because otherwise I'll be reading a lot. So, apologies. Okay, let's just go to Saint Jerome, just because it I read it quickly and it makes sense. So, to us, I don't have to read for a lot. So, Saint Jerome is one of the church fathers, a great church father. There's a church in his honor in Pontrol, local church. Um, Saint Jerome, one of the great things he did was he actually compiled the Bible together. So the scriptures that we're reading, that I'm reading from RSV 2CE, uh, receives its ancient translations from the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate, which he wrote in the 5th century, 400s, um, or 300s, somewhere there. And he pretty much used all the ancient manuscripts, put them together, the Old Testament, New Testament, um, and to preserve the Bible, he wrote it all in Latin and took it with him. So we can thank St. Jerome for the gift of the Bible, So he played a huge part in giving us um, the Holy Scriptures and keeping the authenticity of the words. Okay, so this is what St. Jerome says, who was a great church father. Uh, this is from the letter to Paula and Us Cohen. Basically from the early church, uh, from the 3rd century. Oh, sorry, so it was from, he's from the 200s. Ignore what I just said. Okay, I'm going to get someone else to read. This section there. You can see that. Read the uh, Apocalypse of John and consider what is snug therein of the woman. What is snug therein of the yeah. woman arranged in purple. purple. And the blasphemy written upon her brow, the seven mountains of many waters and the end of Babylon. Come out of her, my people, so the Lord says that ye be not partakers of her sin, and ye not receive her plagues. Turn back also to Jeremiah, and pay heed to what he has written of like import. Flay out of the midst of Babylon, and deliver every man his soul. For Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit. It is true that Rome as a holy church, trophies of apostles and martyrs, a true confession of Christ. The faith has been preached there by an apostle. Heathenism has been trotted down. The name of Christian is daily exalted higher and higher, but display the but display power and size of the city, the seen and being seen, the paying and receiving of visits, the alternate flattery and detraction, talking and listening, as well as the necessity facing so great a thorn, even when one is less in the mood to do so. All these things are like foreign to the principles and fatal, fatal to the repose of the monastic life. Pause there. Sorry, there's so much information, but if you do want to see, I usually sift through all of this before the Bible studies, but again, I weren't planning to do this. Um, you can go on that website, have a look at the verses, have a look at what they say, if you want to do that extra research. Um, otherwise, I guess this is a good introduction, a good way to go into a bit of depth, but there is, of course, a lot more, especially with the book of Revelation. Um, each of those things that I stopped at, that I said we've already covered in the past, they could have been spoken about. Sometimes for half the Bible studies, we'll be focusing on that. So, again... Um, it is there in the previous recording. It's also in there in that website. But I wanted to open the question, if it, uh, open up for questions if there was any so far. Otherwise, we're almost finished chapter 17. The part where it says the king for one hour will get authority with the beast. I think that's the devil. He's mean? like the devil what communicating that means is, with the other beasts. Is that right? Um, Jesus used to say, my hour has not yet come. But then finally, my hour is here. Was the crucifixion it didn't last one hour um, it's a type it's a symbolic way to say they're going to be reigning but 
It's going to be for a period. Then there's the day of the Lord. Mm. The day of the Lord is the final judgment. The final judgment doesn't take place in one day, but it's it's symbolizing that there's going to come a time when God will give his recompense. Be patient, but in a sense, these people, these rulers, are going to be here for a little while compared to eternity. So don't worry too much. They're going to come, they're going to do their evil, but then they're going to leave. Like Napoleon, he kidnapped the Pope. He killed the Pope. People don't realize Napoleon done a lot of very evil things. Very evil things. Um, people always think about Hitler. Yeah, okay, Hitler did do bad things, but they forget about the 10,000 people who did very evil things to people in the church. Um, so there have been very bad... We, comparatively, we live in very peaceful times, in Australia at least, compared to how it was back in the days. We, thanks to everybody was sitting in a nice house and learning about the scriptures in peace. No one's after us trying to kill us. We're not undercover, underground. Like in China, people are not being hunted or being targeted. So, you know, thanks be to God. But there are, have been very difficult times in the history of the church for the people of God. Um, and, of course, there is, today is still very difficult for us, but in different ways. And still in Nigeria, since 2009, how many have been massacred? That's right, especially America, South, yeah. South Africa. It's not good. Yeah. Um... As you said, yeah, these are of one mind and give over their power and authority to the beast. This, this, we could talk a lot about this verse. <clears throat> but basically, I'll say it like this: anyone who, anyone who's against Jesus, is with the devil. Anyone who's, so the Lord said, you cannot serve Mammon and God, for you will love one and and hate the other. You got to choose. Can't strive for worldly ambitions and. Be fully committed into the world and want to, you know, be the greatest politician or the greatest business person or the greatest whatever, necessarily. Because uh, you've got to choose. Yeah, Catholics can have businesses, of course. Yeah, Catholics um, can be in the political atmosphere. But there's you just got to be careful because you've got to put Christ first always and do everything for Christ. So that's something we can say there. Because if you don't, you give over your power and authority to the beast. So if you serve sin and you lie for your job, your job is to lie. Which I actually had a friend, one of my cousins, he used to work, he had to leave his job because that's what he felt he had to do every day, just lie to people. Um, to make them buy things that he knew they didn't need, these services. Um, he used to work for a mechanic um, service centre and he used to call people on upsell. He knew their cars didn't need these things. He knew it, but he had to tell them to get sales, to get commission. Sort of sales-based roles can be a bit dangerous like that. Um, so it's something to be mindful of. But basically, if you're not with the Lord, what's going to happen is you're going to be with the devil and you're going to give over your authority to him because you want worldly success. What did Jesus say um, to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. Just before Peter, Jesus was going to go to his crucifixion in Capernaum, Jesus told him, get behind me, Satan, for um, your, you seek what pleases man and not what pleases God. When Jesus told them, I'm going to go and die and be crucified, Peter said, no, never, Lord. Jesus rebuked him as if he was the devil. Get behind me, Satan, for you want what pleases men. Why? Because who wants to see their Messiah and their idol die, crucified, naked, and embarrassed on the cross? No one wants to see it. But that's how the Lord chose to do it. So sometimes we have to go God's way, and God's way isn't all roses and you know nice rainbows and views. But sometimes God's way is hard, and that's a part of it. So we have to accept that. We grow to learn to accept that, as Peter did. You know, as he matured in the faith, uh, it's not always going to be easy. So, if you're not with him, you're against him. So, that's a really good thing we can take from that verse. Whether you like it or not, or whether you know it or not, that's just the reality. Okay, they have one mind and give over their power and authority to the beast, and they will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them. For he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and those who are <clears throat> with him are called and chosen and faithful. Beautiful verse of hope. When the Masons come against the church, as they did historically, if you look at uh, the life of St. Maximilian Colby, he was very persecuted by the Masons. He actually started the militia of the Maculata um, to combat them. He started spreading uh, the miraculous medals across the world. He wrote a newspaper. He'd done all these works to combat against the evils of what the Freemasons were doing. It's one of the examples of some of the things they've done historically. Just an easy Google search away, but especially look at Maximilian Colby. And his whole life was dedicated to fighting against them. So if people don't know, how can they be so bad? His whole life is a testimony to how they can be so bad. Okay. Um, for he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. 
as he is and that's his rightful place and doesn't matter how rich someone can be no one can take the place of the lord even though in the uh, time of the scriptures caesar exalted himself as god all the soldiers had to worship caesar they used to have the um throw incense and say hail caesar hail caesar um, as a form of uh, worship to him to give him honor not just honor but to literally worship caesar uh, there was a big scandal in the early church actually when some of the christian soldiers they said, you know, how can I say this prayer and I worship the Lord? How can I worship Caesar? And that's a little part of church history in the early church. Interesting to look at and all they came up with that. Um, but no one is the Lord. No one is God except God himself. And no one can be him. And he said to me, verse 15, The waters that you saw where the harlot is seated and the people and multitude and nations and tongue and the ten horns which you saw, they, are the, they and the beast will hate the harlot. And they will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and giving over their royal authority to the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city which has dominion over the kings of the earth. Again, there's a lot here. But just mindful of time because I know Father Benton is going to tell me shortly. Oh. No, okay. Oh, okay, there you go. Paul, it's ten past. Verse 16 And the ten horns that you saw They and the beast will hate the harlot And they will make her desolate and naked And devour her flesh and burn her up with fire Have you ever had someone in your life who You know, you thought You know, was your friend And all of a sudden they turn on you And then like 10,000 things go wrong And they just turn their back And they want to kill you And just everything goes downhill I'm sure someone has experienced that Something similar mm -hmm. That's how the work and the life of the devil is. The devils don't like each other. The demons, they don't, they're not happy to get along. In Christ, we get along, we do it for the love of God. The devils don't have that. They hate each other, but they hate God more. So they work together for the hate of God, not for love, not for unity. So they turn on each other. This, the word the devil, the root word uh, Diablo, <clears throat> it means divider, conqueror, uh, destroyer. These are the definitions of what the word the devil the devil is. Um, I'll put it on my phone. I can tell you the proper things. But the definitions are correct, I remember that. Um, yes, it means the gossiper, the scatterer, the slanderer. That's his very nature. The, na the very nature of the devil is to divide, to gossip, to slander, to hate, the father of lies and murder from the beginning. That's the nature of the devil. The accuser, yes. Many different things the devil does. Um, the one who accuses the brethren night and day before God. Uh, the scriptures tell us his titles. So the devil himself or the devils will turn on this person and they will burn her up. They will devour her flesh. That symbolizes that there's no unity in the devil. There's no unity in uh, evil. Even though sometimes uh, you th people think they can be united for sin, which happens very commonly, even... Um, when Jesus was going to be crucified, uh, Pilate and Herod, they didn't like each other. But it says after Jesus went through them, they became good friends. The scriptures record that. Um, do you think they were real friends? They were united for the hate of Jesus and for mocking the Lord. Of course not. Of course they weren't real friends. How can you have a real friend, someone who hates God, or a real friend who leads you into sin, to doing drugs? As um, someone always says, you know, these people are not your friends. They can't be your friends if they're leading you to their evil ways. Because at the end of the day, in the final judgment, they're not going to say, oh, you know, God, don't worry about him. They're going to say, oh, he made me do it. Like, it happens in the world. If you look um, in the legal system, when people are doing something wrong together, oh, I've got your back no matter what, X, Y, Z. Five minutes later, oh, it was his fault. And they'll just blame each other and they'll hate each other and they'll be divided. That's a, what I see when I read this. Um, I see the division of the devil. I see the accusations of the devil. And I see the two-facedness of the devil and that you can't trust him. So don't go in his territory. Don't do sin and you won't be in his territory. You won't have to worry about this. That's all I wanted to say about that. There's still a lot more that could be said as usual. But I did say something as opposed to saying nothing, which is good. Father, do you have anything you'd like to add? No, you've done a good job, Thank you, God. Anyone else? Speaking on that part... The thing is, is that when there is times of um, tribulation, though, people naturally will turn on each other. 
to, serve, to save themselves. It's happening when we go back to the Armenian genocide. If you research that, you will know that a lot of Armenians turned on Armenians mm -hmm. during that time because they were worried if they didn't do it, if they didn't say mm -hmm. that their own families, they had to protect their families. And they did that. And unfortunately, I think this is even saying we're going to go through times like that again, and whether it's our time or anyone or the future generation, but Christianity is always going to be, we go through times of underground, above ground, and it goes like that, keeps going up and down, you know, and the way society is now, they're always attacking the church. They're always attacking anyone that speaks about God or Jesus or anything like that. Everything that's anti-God is popular, but anything that's to do with God, it's not. Exactly. So we are in that sort of persecution anyway, every single time, whenever we try and tell someone, no, that's not right, we know it's not right, and that's not with God, if you want to teach your children this, but that's not the right way to teach your children, like, you know, it's, but you, if you, you can't say that. That's right. Yeah, the, the world hates us. Even Jesus said, you know, you are not of the world. Yeah. If the world, you know, the world hates you, not for you, but because it hated me first. Yeah. Jesus said, you know, do, do not be afraid. I've already conquered the world. But Jesus sent us out and he told us, like, they're going to hate you. If they did this to the master, what are they going to do to you, the servants? The servants not greater than his master. Yeah. They literally expat on him, they hit him, and they killed him. Well, what's going to happen to us? We expect them to love us. No, they, you know, they don't have the Holy Spirit, Jesus said. They can't receive the Holy Spirit. But you will receive the Holy Spirit. It's all from John. I think I, seven churches, I think I read through this part, the Gospel of John. Um, but he himself said it. Like they can't receive the Holy Spirit. They're blind. They don't. They think they want it. I mean, everyone wants the good. A uh, little bit of theology. Everyone's orientated to the good. No one does drugs because generally when they do it, they orientate their soul and think that's the good that I want. So they'll think doing the drugs is better than not doing the drugs. So people do things. So I think it's better for me to do this Bible study than not to do it. For me, that's the moral choice that I make. So you have an intellect and you have a will. Your intellect is what sort of knows in your mind and your will is what chooses. So these people's intellects are flawed. They think that if I do this, I'm going to receive a good and a happiness. But then they do it and realize, oh, it's empty. If they're lucky, they realize. If, they don't, if they're unlucky and they don't realize, well, it gets worse and worse. Anxiety leads to depression. Depression leads... To Further down leads to despair, leads to suicide, unfortunately, which we know a lot of people are doing these days. A lot of people are struggling. Um, unfortunately, it's a very sad reality. Uh, but that's how it is, how it works. These people perceive the good, and with that, their intellect thought it was good, so they latched onto it with their will, but then they realized, if they realized, um, they just went downhill. And that's what's happening. So a lot of people, when they do evil things, they think it's going to be good for them, but it's not good for them. Yeah, but what's the danger of our society now is that we see it all around us, all of us are seeing it. Mm. Our own families, like anyone, no, I don't think any one of us can say that we don't see it in our own families, where they think that there are certain things that the church teaches that is very hard to, mm. to actually obey all the time, you know? And that sometimes they say, oh, it's okay, we can do that though. It's it's not a bad thing, like it's not hurting anyone. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. historically it's based on feelings and emotions. Yes. Not reason. Yeah. yeah. So it's very easy, how do I say, like uh, sometimes Jesus can appear as like, yeah, he's just you know, sort of like a guru. He's good for advice. You listen when you want, and you don't have to listen when you don't want. Sort of how it is. But Jesus never says, Listen to me sometimes. He never says if you love me, just follow me a little bit and then at night time or on the side, it's your choice. I, I didn't read that once in the Bible. I haven't heard a church father say that. Jesus said, if you love me, um, you have to hate your mother, your father, your own self. That's what Jesus said. Uh, I think those who don't know what does that mean, so I don't want to confuse. Um, you have to be willing to sacrifice, to say no to yourself, to say no to your parents for asking you to do the wrong thing, to say no to your wife for asking you to do the wrong thing for his sake. So it's love God first and then love neighbor second. That's how the command works. The greatest summarized like this. Love the Lord your God uh, and then love your neighbor as yourself. The Lord, that's the order, which means he's always first. I mean, his way is always first. Um, and we know the church is the body of Christ. So when the church speaks, it speaks on behalf of uh, the King of Kings, which is Jesus Christ. It doesn't just say things um, that are theolo the moral theology. So 
Faith and morals is what the church has jurisdiction over. That's their authority to guide us and tell us that God gave them. Like Father Benton always says, the Pope can't say, go and eat Cocoa Pops or go and eat Corn Flakes. Like, that's not the jurisdiction of the Pope to tell us to eat Corn Flakes or Cocoa Pops. But his jurisdiction, um, the jurisdiction of the Magisterium is in faith and morals. So, that's where we receive it from. And sorry, i got one more story to share because it's based on Revelation again. A thing happened to me this week. I told Chantelle already. I was parking my car in Stockland. My car, I do this. I'm in a hurry. I'm just locking my car because that's technology. You don't need your key. And I had my miraculous medal. must have been sticking out like that and the brown scapula because sometimes it just comes out. must have been out. This bloke comes up to me, him and his wife, driving an old car. He comes up and he sees me do this and he goes, oh, I see you're a Christian. And I said, yeah. And he said to me, um, he goes, very practical, isn't it? I said, yeah. And then he said, you know, in Revelation, he goes to me, he goes, you, that's not good. And I said, yeah, I know. He, he, I said, he said to me, eventually it's going to be here. Yeah. And I said to him, well, when it gets here, that's when I'll say no. <laughs> Until then, I'm going to enjoy the... <laughs> but isn't it already there? That, can't you do all that with your smartwatches? I've seen people pay with their smartwatches. Yeah, no, it's going to literally be better oh, than okay. you. But, I'm not um, saying that smartwatches are bad. I'm not saying that. It's going to be better than you. The mark of the beast. Yeah. This is what people speculate. So, very clear. I've ne I didn't say it once in the Bible study. <laughs> this happened to me this um, week. But, yes, yeah, not clear in the scriptures. He said, because I know about the brown scapula, obviously I must be into yeah. my faith. That's yeah. the thing. He's, so, yeah. he just came, this first stranger just comes up to me and he, he's driving an old car. He tells me, I don't use a, I don't use this. I don't use, I told him, do you have a smart TV? He's, he goes to me, I said, because smart TVs are the same. Um, he doesn't use a credit card. He uses bank book. Well, he's Amish. He is. <laughs> but eventually, eventually we might have to all go like that. You know how to follow God, we can't stay on the path of technology because that would be my, maybe the mark of the beast. It might cause us to sin. We don't know. Exactly. But that's yeah. where he thinks he's saying to me that is the mark of the beast. A lot of <laughs> Protestants subscribe yeah. to that opinion where they think it's going to be a literal physical, no. like a chip of some sorts. The reality is, if you do evil, you're part of the beast kingdom already. You're already with the devil. If you don't love the Lord, you're already the devil's. You already belong to him. That's what we need to realize. As Hippolytus, the Pope of Rome, said in the fourth century, these are the people who give their mind over to the beast and give like their deeds, their hands aka their actions so they're already the devils you don't need to worry about getting a cheap if you're doing fornication or using contraception or doing these things which you know you shouldn't use worry about those first because that's what's actually going to send you to hell um can you say um anyone that refuses christ is the antichrist we spoke about that one last week yeah those who say jesus didn't come in the flesh they have the spirit of the antichrist but that was last week's we spoke a lot about that but yes thanks for throwing that in no <laughs> We could really go on and on and on and I could just keep talking, but I don't know. One day I'd like to do that, just have a really long Bible studies to be honest. I think it'd be profitable, especially on the Gospels. Um, well, no. I will throw this out there. I am thinking, Father Benton as well with your blessing, to do something where maybe once a fortnight or something where we have a long sort of Bible studies. Maybe not on a Sunday night. Not, of course, yeah. not tonight. Yeah. Sunday night's already taken. It'll be either a weeknight because uh, usually people are free on weeknights. And we can just sit. I know everyone has questions because everyone has a million questions. Um, sometimes when you read the verse, then you realize, oh yeah, what about this, this and that? That'll be the time for this, this and that to come up. So that's something I'm thinking to do. Because again, I can talk for a long time. And I used to talk for a really long time, but then we've shortened the Bible study. So yes. thanks be to God. But, but I'd like to go back to what we used to do because I think it's very profitable. Um, but that's more we announce soon. So if someone's interested, let me know so I can see who's interested in doing it, what days work for you, and then God willing, we can do that to really go deeper. It's a By the grace of God. But yes, Father, if there's nothing else, um, when you're ready to do the concluding prayer, please. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Queen of the Most Holy Rosary, pray, pray for us. The Lord be with you. And, and with your, your spirit. spirit. Lord bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you, Father. Thank, Thank you, Father. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.